Just before we start, should we sweep, <coughs> the, sweep the set here just so that uh, we can show people how humble we are? Because that seems to be the thing in GA at this stage. Huh? Oh yeah, the uh, the dressing room uh, video. Yeah, down in Nemo Rangers. You, you you think you don't necessarily think that was as cringe as it came across because no, but I think was, I think it was poking fun at the whole like at the culture of it. Like I saw a few people making this point after the the rugby last Saturday. You know, the All Blacks were the yeah were the the pioneers of this uh, this humble trend in, in yeah. world sports. We've sweep got the a sheds. good culture. We sweep the dressing rooms. You know, last All Black out sweeps the dressing rooms. But it's like anything. I suppose initially it kind of. I thought it was kind of cool when I first heard it, you know, for yeah. the first time, like, you know, but then it's just, I suppose it kind of loses its original kind of uh, impact, maybe, and meaning. So you don't think that Nemo were the latest ones trying to cash in? Because I remember <laughs> a year or two ago, Jim Connolly put up a picture of the St. Vincent's dressing room being swept after they played a game with the tag humility. Yeah. And that probably attracted a little bit of ire. Well, I think of the wording of the Nemo one, I think Luke Connolly is a fairly laid back character and also Nemo's social media is quite good. Yeah. Uh, like they had one on Sunday during the game, uh, two goals by Luke in a minute. He nearly made some balls with the second one to be fair to him, you know. So like they're they're very kind of tongue like they're tongue in cheek with score updates, but very good, very entertaining, well worth checking out. So you think let's give him the benefit of the doubt here, you couldn't have been that silly to think in this day and age give, people want that nonsense. Given the account that I would be familiar with. If if it was one that I wasn't familiar with now when I saw that, like, you know, I wouldn't be too sure. But yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay. Uh, we'll start up we'll come back to a little bit of Cork in yeah. a while, but the Dublin Championship final is on this weekend, Ballyboden against Thomas Davis. So Ballyboden beat St. Jude's two ten to one ten in their semi final final coming from behind Thomas Davis beat Kilmacud Croaks the county champions mm. 212 to 110 so I was in Parnell Park for that first thoughts on that like Thomas Davis getting here haven't been here since 1991 when they did the three in a row and they were in the senior B last year won that yeah. no, no one saw this coming no because I'm trying to think of like the recent first time finalists in Dublin I suppose there was a lot made wasn't there Castle Knock a couple of years ago yeah. but ultimately they had you know a superstar in Kieran Kilkenny and they had a couple of other guys who had played underage for Dublin and guys from outside Dublin. They had different underage success, but um, yeah, like Thomas Davis is just it's just an unbelievable story. I mean, we spoke I think last week was it before the semi finals about how the three teams left in it, but the other three teams left in the semi finals. They all had either won recent championships yeah. or in the case of Jude's got to the final and they had you know members of Jim Gavin's all and winning team and Thomas Davis didn't tick those boxes. You know, having won the the senior B last year, but. Fair play to them. I mean, it's it's brilliant achievement. It proves that it's no fluke when you beat Castlenock and Kilmacud. Yeah, definitely not. And Conor McKeown of the Hurls, he had a good tweet out after it. Remarkable story in Parnell Park. Thomas Davis were in huge debt until selling land for around four million in 2017. The same year, were on the verge of taking Dublin County Board to the DRE over plans to split championship into two two tiers. Last year, they won the second tier, effectively a B. A couple of years ago, their best forward, Paul Hudson, a Dublin panelist until 2017, went to America. Now we're in the first senior final since ninety one after beating the Reign and Champions. Yeah, I remember him. He would have been kind of on the the under twenty one teams. I think Jim Gavin yeah, managed. I think yeah. Was it either twenty ten or twenty twelve? You know, he was, a lot of contemporaries that have kind of got on to I suppose bigger and better things at senior level. Yeah. Uh, but like the thing about them that struck me was that just from the outside is that the two stories I remember them were that story about the DRA and then the whole Tala Stadium controversy when Shamrock Rovers were mm. getting it and so they just kind of became known for off the field stuff. You know, I w you know I would have heard that. Back in the nineties, obviously guys like Paul Kern and uh, was it Dave Four and you know they were quite big then. They got to an All Ireland club final one year, but you know, like happens with a lot of clubs, it's kind of the ebb and flow had kind of slipped yeah. back. But uh, yeah, especially the fact that they've come straight up from the the Senior B Championship last year to kind of get to to a Senior A final. Um, yeah, it's super super achievement. You think of in, in in summer like Tala that there's a huge kind of there's a huge chance. To get that massive population playing Gaelic football, mm. but like several people would have told me that initially when they came up to Dublin, you know, moved up to Dublin, that they would have seen areas like this were basically a wasteland for GA. That there were so few teams, or certainly they weren't really penetrating at all. So soccer so strong out there. Yeah, you know? yeah. I wonder could this be a, a catalyst in the area? It may or may not. Yeah. Be, but uh, and I think other other people were pointing out that all their players are homegrown, their management are homegrown. Now. I mean, there's obviously. I mean, I, I moved into a club in Dublin, so obviously I would point to the positives of lads coming in because I could definitely see how it helps. At the same time, it's probably good for for local lads to think, you know, I could do that too. I don't need to be a lad up from the country to be good enough. Yeah, like I look. I don't have any problem with the kind of guys moving to clubs, and it's just it's a 
it's a product of basically the economic reality in Ireland mm. that so many people move to Dublin. Centralization. Yeah, and like you just see so many of the Dublin teams over the last couple of years that have got to county finals or won it. They just invariably have guys from other counties have started moving to them. Like, you know, Jules last week had you know, Coakley of Cork and Porra Clark is like on, mm. you know, a couple of more. Um, you know, I think we spoke like Kevin Dice with Kilmacud, you know, you, you could go on. So it is quite unusual and it is quite striking and it kind of bucks the recent trend that kind of have been developed uh, what Thomas Davis has done. Because some lads would probably have to give up playing football or hurling if they couldn't play it. Yeah. And, um, by the way, Michael Darren McCauley, he probably had the most Jekyll and Hyde performance I've ever seen. He gave away five frees early on in the game, well, probably before the 35th to 40th minute. Three of them were for over carrying. And like he turned it around, set up a goal late on, you know, really yeah. nailed into the game. But uh, Bowden were kind of reflective of him. Poor enough in the first half. Chris Guckian got a goal, put Jude's in in right shape looked like they were kicked some really good points still in the first half you know Tom Devlin got a couple now yeah. Coakley got a couple um, they looked in a really really uh, strong position but you know once I thought all the momentum was kind of with Bally Bowden as the second half was yeah. going on the, know, the basket is really I think once they upped it so Thomas Davis were playing away from the golf course end of the field yeah. and when you're on that field you really really notice the hill they could not get the ball up the field mm. and then when when it was being sucked back down the field Holly Pascal takes over once again, 1-4, one, 1-5. One, uh, he's such a good player. Yeah. Uh, free, like frees, goals, points from play, it didn't matter. He's yeah, he scored one unbelievable point off his left foot when he kind of stepped inside. Yeah. Do you think that Thomas Davis, though, like part of this is a product of Kilmacud Crokes losing Paul Mannion and Craig Diaz to injury during yeah. the game, that if Crokes' team had to stay together throughout the whole outfit, this wouldn't have happened? <laughs> Yeah, I suppose, and I guess it's it's you know if you're an underdog team in those situations, you know you're playing against the reigning champions, their stars, you know you hang in with them, and that's what they did in the first half, and then you start to go gain a bit of confidence, don't you? And then the injuries, and then you know they got a little bit lucky with the goal, the forward was really really alert for it when um, uh, the, you know the high ball was dropped uh, dropped to the Kim good yeah. goalkeeper, and then they got the second goal straight after, and then suddenly, you know. I suppose you get the good fortune, but you then need to avail of it. Yeah. So I'd argue that like they, they, they Kilmacud lost a couple of players, but you know Thomas Davis went for it. They got grew in confidence, obviously because they got up to a good enough start. You know that like that's the big thing as underdogs. You know if, if you the famous one I always think of was the Kenny Limerick all in hurling final two thousand and seven. Like you know mm -hmm. that's the nightmare start. Like when you can see a couple of goals earlier on, like you you, you want to kind of work your way into the game, yeah. and then those chances will will arise for you. You'd hoping as the, as the match progresses. The, the Kirby brothers, of course, stand out and, and one of them got the goal, brilliant goal. Mm. Really took it the whole way into the house before firing yeah. into the net. Brilliant. Super finish. Davy Kyo, I mean, what a revelation he was. He wore a number 13 shirt. Plenty, I, I'm sure plenty of people in Dublin would know that he's a Dublin hurling panellist. Sort of guy with that engine would definitely be of some use. Yeah. I think the question, like when I asked uh, some of the boys that play in there, it's a question of finding a position for him, but some athletes mm. and just... As other lads are slowing down, he was driving on and driving on. As a team, they finished very strongly, mm -hmm. you know. The other thing for Crokes, I wonder is there sort of a legacy of even losing to Molyneokta last year so publicly that the whole country was looking at it thinking, right, you're a huge club, you, you've got to beat Molyneokta, a tiny little parish. Yeah. And just the legacy of white line fever there, it didn't work out. That again, they're thinking, oh no, this is happening again during the game. I wonder is there an element of that? Yeah, possibly. And I suppose as well, like Mannion was... I remember the county final last year he was absolutely outstanding like, it was mm. one of the real great so one man like shows yeah and he got a goal as well like, so I suppose maybe you lose him um, yeah that, like it's it's just one of those you know when, it, when a kind of a lower f or lesser fancy side kind of wins like you know try, trying to analyse it you know it's, I think you can argue that it's always the kind of combination of kind of all those little factors yeah. you know Galway finals on this weekend the replay between yep. Carfin and Shum there was six minutes of injury time played three was what there was supposed to be. And um, Tum looked like they had it won. Gary Sice then gets a free for something that was supposed to be a marginal enough call towards the end, knocks it over from 35 yards. Um, but I mean, straight away everyone thinks Carfin, once they get, like, if you don't catch him the yeah. first day, you're gone. I actually saw that back actually. I did think it was a free, but I think mm. one of the arguments was, I suppose, how late, uh, how much injury time had, had been played, you know. I, I think you still have to side with Cora Finn because they have shown they can get through replays, whether it's been in, you know, in Galway Championship matches, as we've seen uh, with last year's final, um, that they kind of get the job done yeah. at, at the second attempt. And as well, the fact that it's a two-week break, I think that's been nice with them. I know Dahi Burke would have been playing the county hurling yeah. semi-final last week, mm, but, but the rest of them, you know, even like how Tune tactically set up, um, 
just all those little things you know that you you can kind of look at to try and kind of get it right um i'm not you know not rating shooting stars off you know they, they did like it was, stuff, it was it was a very impressive i suppose you know if they've gone really really defensive like you know they maybe with mount belly did last yeah, year yeah. very hard to kind of sustain that maybe and be successful at that a second game but they seem to really kind of go for it and got the couple of goals uh, to kind of give them the impetus but well, that's why i give them a chance because they're clearly showing they can play football against like just think of Cora Finn's all Ireland finance over the last number of years. Yeah. They beat the snot out of Dr. Crokes last year. They bloodied Nemo Rangers the year before. And back in 2015, they won't convince you. Shot me by yeah. 10 points. So every time, once they get out and get the, get the momentum up there, they're killing teams. But Tume took them on. Um, it's not like Mount Bellew last year. They drew seven points apiece, and then the replay was eight point. Oh, I think it was something like um, it was one, one eight to one five. Or nine to, yeah, something, something like that. that yeah. Really low score in Dower, but I think Tune will go for it again. You know, people heard of Gary O'Donnell, and probably not too many more after that. They're at home, albeit it's only three miles up the road from Carfin, and it's probably more like a home venue. It's, it's a very familiar there. venue to them with yeah. the Connacht games they play there and everything. Yeah. You know, but still, in all, like there, there's plenty playing in their favour, and the fact that they're going to play football and. It's not like they're going to rely on Carfin not going to be able to score. They have scores themselves, so I give them a bit of a chance. But much like yourself, how how do you how on earth do you back against Carfin? Yeah. Um. The Connacht club semi-finals are on the, or quarter-finals. A couple of quarter-finals are on this weekend. Tourist Strand of Sligo are against Park Pierce's of Roscommon. And Park Pierce's are sort of warm favourites for this game, but it's how do you react to winning your first ever county title? Mm. Yeah. yeah the, the, again. Something as, as small as the fact that it's a couple of week gap, I think that has to surely stand in their favour. You know, I think they'll have had it'll be three weeks, I think, uh, from Sunday since the, since the Roscommon final. Two or three weeks. Either, and either way, the fact that you don't have to go out the same week as yeah. going on a relentless booze, Let's be honest. They've also actually a good few of them would have been in a kind of intermediate campaign with the club. Yeah. I think at the start of the decade, so it's not a completely new thing for them in trying to turn it around. And there also has to be. And I'm sure they're just trying to look from the exact same way. When you look at Connacht, when Galway Mayo, I'm only saying I'm they're on the opposite side of the draw. Well, the way so, it works out, right? If you're Tour de Strand, and the, the bookies haven't separated these by too yeah. much, it's like 5 6, 6 to 5 type thing in, in favour of, I think, Park Pierce's. But if you win this game, you're then playing a London team who are no longer All Ireland quarter preliminary quarter or quarter finalists. They're now in there. So you have to win this game, beat a London team, and you're in the uh, you're in the Connacht final. Yeah, so it has to be viewed as a big chance at that point. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, like Tour de Strand, the fact that they it was four in a row in Sligo, they're probably looking at it the same way, and that you know we want to start making an impact. And yeah. Sligo clubs haven't really done, you know, much. I think maybe I think Eastern was it Eastern Harps or Curry. I'm not too sure. One of them was in a Connacht final maybe about 15 years ago. But in general, uh, it's kind of been a Galway, Mayo, Roscommon. Uh, True St Bridget's dominated affair over the last while. Your your knowledge of Sligo was pretty good there. Eastern Harps got to the final against Carfin in 08. Um, Curry lost to Caltra in 2003. This is all and quite some information to be retaining yeah, from somewhere, you know. Yeah, and the last time a Sligo won it was a uh, team was of course 1983 when St Mary's did it. Right, uh, so that kind of tells you what they've been kind of swimming against the tide. Yeah, um, they're, they're, they've won it three times. The only club to do so. When they're kind of coming out, but yeah, like I think. Maybe London's team are probably looking at it similar, but when these draws come out like this, and the kind of the county champions, especially when you have a team like Curfin who've dominated yeah. so much, and you know we'll move on to Valentine in a couple of minutes, like you know when they they have kind of such big name players, I think both of them have to be looking at that. It's a massive opportunity. Um, but the other thing from Porter Pierce's point of view, you have that you've, you've got over that obstacle now. Mm -hmm. You won your county final. You can kind of relax and maybe you know that that tension is kind of maybe released. You know, and like the five guys that played when they whatever was coming the kind of senior final. Um, uh, when they won the Connacht Senior Final during the summer, you know Pat Flanagan as well has a lot of experience, doesn't he, of like provincial mm -hmm. club campaigns yeah. and all that and county, you know. So I think a few things uh, that those things kind of stack in their favour. Ballantubber then against Glencairn Manor, Manor Hamilton of Leitrim. So Ballantubber won their county final, beating Balladrine one fourteen to one eleven. Five titles in the decade is, is fair going, no matter what your your county is. Especially when they hadn't won one before then. Mm, yeah, it started off with James Horan yep. back in twenty ten. As I think he was, he was just heading out the door to be Mayo manager, but he did, he was involved with the winning. I think he was for the first thing. He definitely guided them to an intermediate win yeah. uh, before that. That's how he kind of came into the frame. But, you know, I think it nags at them the fact that they haven't converted one of them into a Connacht, you know, yeah. especially when they probably looked at Castlebar have converted a few. 
Yeah. Um, and different different clubs in Mayo have a lot, lot of good records. They're going back to the kind of nineties and noughties as well. Um, Got to two finals, both against Cara Finn. They've lost the Galway opposition every time. Yeah. They actually lost the Cara Finn another time. I think maybe in a semi, and they lost the Kilrear in one year. Um, Sixteen to one on here. Ah, yeah, you'd, you'd have to fancy them, would yeah. you? Like, I mean, uh, especially given their kind of level of ambitions and, you know, you, the O'Connors and like... Jason um, Gibbons, Mike, Alan Dillon's in Mike, there. Michael Plunkett's in there, you know. Yeah. And, and the way they won, like, they're very, very difficult to beat. Like, the way they won their games uh, against Balana and Balladarine when they kind of came from behind, they just kind of have that know, know how, how to win games. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd take them to win this and kind of set up a semi-final against the Galway champions. And just a word then on Glen Carman or Hampton. They, they had lost four Leitrim finals going back to 2012, um, so they're back on top there. 22 years since the Leitrim team made it to O'Connor final, they've never won it. So, I mean, the chances are, I mean, you probably couldn't get bigger odds here because they'd have to go through Mayo, then they'd have to go uh, Mayo away, I should, I should add. Exactly, then, yeah. <laughs> then go away and then... And it's a very familiar venue for Ballantober. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Ulster Court finals are on this weekend also. We'll start off with Castle Ryan against Neil Connell, who just won Donegal after. So, like, they needed two replays, uh, Neil Connell being Glenties, for those who use that term. Uh, beat uh, Guido after two replays, and it was a contentious decision to win the to win the title there on Wednesday night. Yeah. Uh, John O'Malley, who came on and scored the winner. First of all, if if we just uh, if we just go to that winner, very very unclear. I mean, there was a lot of contention at the end of the game. People are very unsure. We're talking about a dark <coughs> evening. Nice sweep and move from Glenties, by the way. A shot from the right hand side, and people are looking back over. People are putting the replay up on Twitter, which you can find on Rory Cavanagh if you go to his Twitter and then go to the tweets and mentions part. Um, or tweets and replies you can see it's very very hard to actually decide if that's a score or not yeah I only saw it back this morning for the first time on, yeah. on Rory's Twitter and was trying to freeze frame it and go back I thought it wasn't initially but a lot of people seem to be saying it was a point but like what a heartbreaking way to, lo to mm. lose it like you know after you put so much into it and extra time and you won Ulster last year and you probably want to get back there and you think of some of their the most experienced players in Guido or yeah. flip side then what a way to win it but it's it's really really tough the fact that they have to go back out now on Sunday the positioning of the umpires I thought was now and I, I understand these lads are standing out on a cold evening Wednesday evening it's dark they're probably they're probably mad to get home yeah I get that but like the the guy on the right hand side of, as you look at the the shot being taken he should be trying to get behind the post I would have thought does he presume the other guy is getting behind yeah he's but it's harder for the other guy to get across yeah um, so they both seem to be kind of like you know, might as well be staring at a uh, field of thistles kind yeah. of thing. But the thing that gives it away for me that says that I think that this is a point is the reaction of the goalkeeper. And if you do look at that video, he runs to get the ball as quickly as he can. It's almost like, okay, that's over, I need to get the ball. Because he, he, he would have been waving wide if it wasn't. And he's right up against the upright. So yeah. I think it's Audrey McNeilish is waving furiously, like, you know, that yeah. it's a wide ball, but the keeper is trying to get back in, get, get it back in play. I would say that the, the Glenty lads, would, you could see on the on Kevin Cassidy's uh, Twitter that, um, that of course, Guido were able to let their hair down last night, uh, on Wednesday night and have a few drinks and what have you. Do you think that the Glenty lads, having lost the, two, the last two finals, you'd want, there'd be some release and you'd want to go and celebrate. Would they have even celebrated knowing that just a couple of days later they're going to be playing against Cabin or the Cabin champions? Um... I think it'd be a shame if they didn't celebrate like Less than in disguise maybe that it's a work night and they have to get up for work so yeah. they can't go nuts. Well in that you wonder like, you know, so many Donegal clubs players aren't based in Donegal, so yeah. I wonder would a lot of them, you know, based in Dublin or wherever, like off today, um like that's very difficult for a club so they'd have to go back and play a game midweek, especially with if they've guys like in that case that are away from home. Like, I think Ballantober a couple of years ago had to do with Mayo after one of the years where Mayo got another final replay and they had a lot of guys based outside not based at home basically, they played a match on a Wednesday night. I mean you know, it's like Cork and Dublin City clubs invariably have their guys kind of at home, but logistically that's going to be really, really, really tough for them, like, you know. Um, and also, it's a feral trip that they have to make on Sunday now. It's probably one of the longest ones you can yeah, yeah. make make, uh, make within Ulster. Um, 20s to Cavan. Yeah. To so, like, Cavan clubs haven't really, you know, done much really in uh, Ulster over the last couple of years, but you'd have to think that they're, they're going to fancy this one, the fact they're at yeah. home. Like, the Castellan beat... Um, own rule of Derry last year. I think they were kind of mm. that was their first title or first time in a long time. It was, yeah, it was Castle Ryan's first title ever. Yeah, so like to not do well last year, they beat Rammer United and they're back in it. So maybe this is the year where they will and they'll, they'll have had three games. They'll have had three hours and 20 minutes 
worth of footage in the space of 10 days to yeah. sit back and watch these two the teams. Donald, Keog- Donald Keoghan's in charge of him, who would have been in charge of Calvin, like, so right. he's a fairly experienced manager. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'd imagine they should know the game plan and the, the kind of guys to watch out for fairly well at this stage. Um, f- just another note from that Donegal final is that um, there was a bit of a, a schmazzle, we'd put it, at half-time. Eamon McGee was involved in something, so he came out for the start of the second half and was shown a red card. Right. I would say for... Um, for any team, never mind Guido, that's going to be very hard. To, you, you, if you had a red card, you'd like to know straight away so you can plan for the second. Yeah, yeah. They've made their plans and then they see him being sent off. That must be tough. There's yeah. another red card uh, late on for Oren McFadden Ferry as well. Um, so that's that game. Kilku against Mahara Felt. So down champions against the Derry champions. I think this is uh, like, I put a tweet out about um, Kilku. They've won eight county titles from mm. the last nine. They've been to two Ulster finals from, from their eight kind of entries into it and they've lost to the eventual champions in three of their of their I think in their last three Ulster campaigns like when you think of teams that have been on this interminable voyage yeah. to try and get there who comes to mind for you most recent probably the, the, that current group of Valley Gunner hurlers to try and get out of Connacht mm. uh, Tober as well probably another example yeah. recently you know um, eight now was pretty pretty huge um, and especially with the amount of you know, the amount of down seniors they have, you know, experienced guys like Conor Laverty and the Johnsons and mm-hmm. is it uh, Paul Devlin as well, is, is that club. Um, you know, you'd imagine, and even the fact that the links, like getting someone like Mickey Moore and in, like, you know, given all of his success in various counties and what he did with Schlock Neal. Um, Not yeah. to mention, like, you know, so they're against the Derry team, they also have Conor Gilligan and Paul Devlin involved. So yeah. it's, it's like a full Derry backroom team. Serious management team they got in. I got some great um, responses to that, so I put up, you know, what other teams have had similar stories to yeah. Kilku in terms of, like, the, the voyage, and um, Carl Mulcair said Bally Bowden and Leinster Hurling, um, so they obviously won five in a row in Dublin there and added a couple after, it didn't quite happen. GEA stats said Moran Abbey, the uh, ladies, they won Munster since 2014, lost all Ireland finals in 14, 15 and 17, semi-final 16, all by narrow scores. Yeah, they, they finally won it last year then. Yeah, yeah, and then... Um, uh, GA stats also said St. Gauls of Antrim. Now, this is slightly different because they obviously ultimately won it as well. Yeah. But Antrim winners from in one in 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10. Ulster winners in 3 and 7. Uh, sorry, that was Ulster uh, finalists. Finalist 3 and 7. Won it in 2005 and 9. Uh, finalists in the All Ireland in 2006 and then won it in 2010. So that is some void. I think there's a good few Ulster clubs that have suffered ultimately at the hands of Cross McGlen. You know, I think oh, yeah. I think Mayo Bridge lost a couple. I think Ballin Derry, I know they won it in the noughties. I think they would have lost a couple to Cross McGlen before they won it in maybe 13. Marvin Connolly said that uh, Road, they won 10 county finals since 2004 and lost the provincial. That is a big one, yeah. Five times? Yeah. Ouch. And a lot of those same players involved in them, you know? Yeah, and um, Darren Kelly added that they were unlucky, especially, especially in 2008, losing against uh, Kim McCord. Someone at Shawnee, 1962, Albert never got the All-Ireland and they never will. Too busy. Re- oh, wait, no. I'm not sure about <laughs> reading out the rest of that. But um, And Daniel Kennedy said, Mike Harkey won the mid-junior football from 2007 to 2010, but never won the county. Went up intermediate in 2012, won the county there in the first year. Yeah. So that's that. Port Leach is all in Leinster football. I know they won, they won a couple, yeah. but they seem to have um, Dublin opposition, like, you know, Barry Bowden, Vincent's Port Leach, or... Uh, yeah, Bal- Ballymun, Ballyboden and Vincent, I think they've all had tough days against them in finals. Especially that one against Ballyboden was a Paul, Paul, Paul Callan, Callan three, the yeah. three from was yeah. it 14 or 21, geez, yeah. That no. was a very tough one to take. Yeah, I saw a quote from um, Paul Devlin, just to come back to Kilku, and he said, we'll come up against a very, very defensive Maher Felt team, and we've been faced with that week in, week out and down football all year. So Maher Felt, they won their first Derry title, and everyone probably saw the interview with Danny Heaven, referring to his mother watching over him, yeah. who had passed away, of course. Uh, for, sorry, 40, 41 year wait for their Derry title. So are they in bonus territory? It comes back to this whole thing of they haven't, you know, have they kind of reached it's their goal for the year? That's that. But it's just it's just when you're looking at these games, it's just hard to kind of put that form guide because mm. we have because it's the first round of the provinces. You know, if yeah. you're looking at the county final, at least you have the kind of form to go on. Um, and also, you also wonder, you probably don't know until you see these games, is the standard in one county higher than another? Yeah. And what sort of talent has come through but on the basis of you know Kilku it's kind of a means to an end like you know mm-hmm. they, they so badly want that uh that ultra title um you know you'd be taking them to win it 
Derry Connolly against Twilight then, so Fermanagh team against the Throne champions. Separate the two clubs separated by Loch Earn and I was reading an Andy Waters piece and he was talking about how the they'd know each other and that they yeah. had an annual challenge game against yeah. each other and he mentioned that Derry Gonnelly's Ryan Jones and Trillick's Matty Donnelly, they were classmates and teammates at St Michael's in Enniskill. Yeah, I was only I think it was that Matty Donnelly was up for an interview a couple of years ago and I just remember him talking about that, you know, wouldn't have been aware of the geography of it. He mm. said basically like Enniskillen is like the nearest town kind of for them like they were the last kind of club in Tyrone in, the, yeah. in that part of West Tyrone um, so like I suppose going back to what we were saying earlier about that trip for Glinties that's a nice one for Trillick not having to travel too far yeah. even though you're going into to another county um, that was probably a big one for Derry Gonley to kind of beat Carrigan a couple of weeks ago but again Trillick this would be their second county so you'd be thinking like the quality the quality of players they have on paper with the amount of guys that have played for Tyrone Senior aside yeah. from Matty Donnelly Richie it, Donnelly uh, Rory Brennan, Lee Brennan. Lee Brennan, Brennan. yeah. Um, but like, why have Tyrone teams got such a poor record? The only team to ever win Ulster is Eric Kieran twice. Yeah, I wonder does it take a lot out of them in the county? It's like it's hugely competitive up there. You know, mm. there's so many different winners over the last couple of years. Um, I think it was between themselves and Wexford with the two senior football championships that had that record with the with the volume of different county champions. Um, yeah, it's a strange one, especially when they've been so strong. Uh, in the Ulster Football Championship over the last couple of years, yeah. as the kind of county said. I'm just wondering, like, for for a few decades, maybe would like Tyrone not have been as strong as other counties? Like, even if you look at their the amount of Ulster titles they won, between let's say they didn't win any Ulster title up until the 50s, and of course the club titles are only yeah. around since the 70s. But like, they didn't win anything up until the 50s. A couple in the 50s, one in the 70s, one in the uh, three in the 80s, and then. So as you so they weren't exactly the leading county, and then Cross McGlen completely take over for God knows how long up in Ulster. So mm. maybe when their team started coming to the fore, it just happened to be at the wrong time. But even like there's no one doing kind of two or three in a row up there, whereas like say the other aside from Cross McGlen, other uh, clubs that have won Ulster lately. You know you think of you know Schlock Neil and Goals and all this. Mm. They've been kind of dominating their uh, their county championships. Actually, and I know they haven't got through Scottstown this year, but they were looking for a five in a row. Very Donnelly yeah. have a five in a row. So there, there seems to be a nice bit of that going yeah. on of teams uh, starting to dominate. So um, I'd say most people probably would expect um, Trillic to come through here. Yeah, I yeah. think so, yeah. Um, okay, so the final game then um, this week is the Ulster Court final between uh, Cross McGlenn and Clough Tibbert. That's on on Saturday night. Um, there's an interview with Oshin O'Neill um, on our game, so you can check that out on the YouTube playlist there. And... It's just become basically the John McEntee game, so the Cross McGlenn legend managing Clan Tibbert um, against his home club yeah. in the Athletic Grounds. Um, what's like? How awkward do you think that is? Because I know he was in the clubhouse the night that um, that Cross McGlenn won the county title. It must have been so weird walking around and everyone talking about it. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be really, really strange. Like the only, like the main example I can think of was the twenty thirteen Munster Club final. Sean Stack, six mile bridge man. Took in a pier to play six mile bridge, six mile bridge, and they absolutely hammered them yeah. in the Munster final. And I remember we interviewed him afterwards on the pitch in uh, in Cusick Park, and he was just saying, "Look, I'm always a bridge man. I'll be in the bridge tonight." Um, but he was just speaking about how difficult he'd found it. I think he actually subsequently took over Clan Lara and he had the same experience against them in the county yeah. final, but lost that one, you know. But I presume once you take it on, and especially if you take on a county like that, a club like that, who are going for a senior championship. You know, you have to think. Look, there is a possibility, but given they're different counties, you know, you might get mm. might get lucky enough. But obviously, the way that, the way the draw panned out, um, but like he seems to have done a serious job, given the fact that they beat a really really good Scotsman team. Hugh uh, Gallagher um, tweeted saying, "From last weekend, Shane Smith is a coach of Kilmacud Croaks and is originally a Thomas Davis man." Right, man, I think. And uh, Sean Stack was mentioned by Joe Ryan. Just read out his tweet. Sean Stack was manager of Tumivar and played against them for Six Mile Bridge in the Munster Club final of '93. Temporarily stepped aside as two manager when both teams reached the final. Then. You hear you hear that going on, don't you? In counties, yeah. let's say if a guy takes over, you know, I don't know, neighbouring parish or another parish nearby, uh, club that you know, if they if they cross paths in the county championship, he won't, you know, he might train them on the Thursday night, but he won't be involved then on the Saturday or Sunday, which I always think is fair enough to be honest. It'd be a weird one, like uh, just even to talk about something that I saw up close. Uh, Niall Keane who joined Kula from Ballier yeah, yeah. and then of course uh, we end up in an All-Ireland club final against Ballier Bigger thing, what are the chances of that? Like? Yeah, there's a great photo of himself and his brother Angus yeah. and just at Croke Park that day chatting after the game such a strange one because yeah. I would have been driving out in and out to train with him the whole time and he's just like 
I can't believe this has actually happened. And you know, you're a few games out from it. You know, let's say Valier hadn't won their province and Cool hadn't won either. And he's like, this can't actually happen. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's kind of funny. So um, your own club, uh, Aero, did the business last weekend in the Premier Intermediate in Cork uh, against St. Michael's. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was brilliant. Just absolutely brilliant. Uh, so I suppose to explain the kind of intermediate grid in Cork, the way it's, it's split into two. So we won, one, so we won the junior county in 2008 mm -hmm. in football. Um, would have been kind of traditionally a hurling club uh, kind of in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, familiar story, kind of underage, kind of got strong and then kind of gradually did, uh, kind of got a little bit better in adult and, and improved. So won the junior in 08, intermediate in 2014 and then just been kind of knocking on the door the last few years for the Premier Intermediate. Would have lost three semi-finals, I think. Hadn't mm -hmm. reached the final. Uh, we lost one of them after a replay, the first year we, we got up. So, and like, would have developed a pretty big rivalry with St. Michael's over the last couple of years. Who've had a lot of heartbreak. Basically. They've had a lot of heartbreak, yeah. So they would have knocked us out of the championship the last uh, two years um, in 17 and 18. And yeah, they've been, unfortunately, the, the luckless club that, it, you know, you see it in various counties, guy, teams just get to the yeah. finals. Was it like five losses in eight years? Five losses in eight years. And this was a third final in a row where they were defeated. And again, nothing between it. Like, you know, it was, you, could, you could see kind of both sets of players. It was like, because both of them, Obviously, so Michael did get to finals. Hero could be getting to semi finals. Uh, it was a very, very kind of 10 second half. Like it was 11 11 for close. a while. Oh, it was close to all Yeah, 12 yeah. 11. Like it was 8 7 and a half time. Um, they were on the attack. I think it was 12 11. We, uh, one of our defenders managed to turn it over and then we went up the field. We got a point. We got a point from that kick out. Suddenly it was a three point game and mm. just able to hold on. They got one point towards the end. So yeah, 14 12. So big relief and just, yeah, just be delighted. Like I suppose, like any club, you're just delighted for the guys. The long-serving players involved. Um, well, of course, you have skin in the game with your brother, Ryan, yeah. who's a Cork senior footballer on the team. Brother would have been playing, and like you definitely notice, it's like a lot of the players are kind of under twenty-four. But you notice over the last couple of years how much I suppose, like you know, when you, you kind of come out of underage ranks and you start playing adult football, just after a couple of years, how much it starts to mean if you do, if you haven't been successful, mm. basically, but you've been kind of getting close, you know. So I think I think it was relief was the, was the big one, and also I suppose to, to kind of explain the context, it was kind of strange backdrop to the game and that next year the Cork they're regrading the championship so it's going to be five grades of 12 so so they're calling it like Premier Senior and Senior A it's mm. effectively Senior A and Senior B so Aerog and St Michael's were going up anyway yeah. as were the team Aerog would have beaten in the semi-final Bantry but um, you want the, the that county title exactly that's it but the thing is like everyone's gone up to the, the grade but it's one team goes up uh, with the trophy that's the, that's the thing yeah people would have heard some of the names on your team like Daniel Goulding yeah. who you'd be friendly with and of course uh, that man Kieran Sheehan former Cork star went to the AFL plenty of injuries etc but uh, he's back yeah he came back about six or seven weeks ago um, came on in the semi-final it would have been his first game I think in six years for the club mm -hmm. um, and then came on with about 20 minutes to go on Sunday um, made all the difference by, by all accounts yeah it was really really good like you know first shot all right now was, pr was pretty well wide as we were saying to him like it wouldn't even even be in a behind in the AFL <laughs> but it, like his impact then after that and it was that type of a game you know like you were thinking either a sub is going to make a difference right. or someone will get a goal eventually that there was no goals um, was he as direct as ever but yeah he like you could see like you could see the impact that he could have he had in the last 20 minutes just you know his usage of the ball and his ability uh, to kind of win it like and uh, yeah Great for him, great for him to get Was back. Was Ronan McCarthy there watching? I don't know. I presume. I presume with the senior final after there was a, there would have been a, a some member of the management uh, would, would have been there to, to, to watch the two games. But um, yeah, just just absolutely brilliant. Like you know yourself, like it's yeah, just great stuff. The kind of Sunday evening in the club and the kind of Monday around the place and yeah, there's just a great buzz. You had a heavy few days of it. We enjoyed ourselves. We I certainly enjoyed ourselves. Yeah, you did. Had a few shandies. What about the senior final then? Nemo Rangers beating Duhallo. Yeah. Uh, so it was a strange one in the sense that I. Like Nemo dominated the first half, got a couple of goals from Luke Connolly, mm -hmm. were up by ten and a half time, and it was pretty disappointing. Like I think it was a, it was a live game on TJ Carr, so you'd imagine pe you know some people might have maybe turned off uh, as uh, at half time. But then do Hollow were on top for the second half. Like I think I saw the one of the Nemo. I think it was the goalkeeper was interviewed, and he was kind of saying he was just angry at the final whistle almost, but the way they were kind of very sloppy yeah. in possession and maybe not closing at the game. But he made a brilliant save towards the end. Um, on Duhallo, so yeah, unfortunately Duhallo lose for the second year in a row. Um, I suppose the kind of fairy tale one would have been for someone like Donald O'Connor at 38 years of age to get his county, and he he'd been kind of struggling going into the game with an injury, and it was kind of a nice moment actually. He came off with about 15 minutes to go, and it was right in front of where I was standing, and the whole stand was just applauding him, like mm. you know. Um, well, he's the top. He's going to retire. Well, really? you you don't know, like, but I suppose yeah. it's just more, you know. 
opportunities for county finals. You know, he's lost. They've lost three of them now over the last while. Um, but yeah, Nemo just kind of just kind of got over the line. But it was that kind of a day. It felt for you see Doctor Cox were kind of struggling and Kerry. Uh, they managed to get out with a draw, and uh, Nemo got the victory. And they're the two historically. Do you imagine me going into the the Munster Championship? They're like if uh, Nemo have to play Newcastle West now, but if they win that, then they're playing the the Kerry champions. Um, in the semi-final stage. Do you sense that, like from Nemo Rangers, who've won it before and got to All Ireland finals, when they won it in the final whistle, were they going mental or was it fairly reserved? No, no. I, th I think it meant a lot to them because mm. the way they would have lost, gone out of the championship last year, they lost at the quarter-final stage, only scored four points. I think they were scoreless for a lot of that game, mm. so that was a very disappointing exit for them. But I mean, for a couple of their players, uh, Paul Kerrigan, who people would know, and there'd be kind of two other guys, Colin O'Brien and Peter Morgan. Um, it was Kerrigan's eighth, and I think O'Brien and Morgan would be around for all those as well. So, like, that's an absolutely incredible haul, isn't it? Eight, mm -hmm. eight county senior medals. It's fair going. Um, right, I think that's it for, that's it, yeah. for Club Top Football this week. If there's anything we missed, uh, message us at FO213, I believe, at, sure. at Shane Saint. And uh, don't forget to follow us on YouTube by clicking on that circle just there.